I'll hand you over to Vikas, who's going to talk about the butterflies to watch in, in Madras. So I, I do not think anybody needs to be introduced to Vikas, but I would still do it. I, um, uh, I think Vikas has been doing some phenomenal work, especially on the butterfly side. He's, he is some city, Chennai city coordinator for the, for the butterfly society. Yeah or some such thing. And um, he has, uh, I think, recorded over 130 species uh, of butterflies in, in the city of Chennai. And um, I had the pleasure of going along with him for, uh, for a couple of these sessions at the Hindi Time Park. Uh, that is the first time I saw the monkey puzzle. And so, uh, so I think uh, uh, now leave it to Vikas to regale us about the uh, the butterflies to watch in Madras. Vikas, over to you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. As sir. usual, uh, as usual, just one yep. minute. Yeah, keep please keep your video and your uh, mics switched off. And any questions uh, to be uh, keyed into the chat box, which Vikas will take up at the end of the session. Yeah, Vikas. Thank you. Yeah, and um, I'll be sharing my screen. Can you see it? Is it visible? No, we can. We can see it. Ah, okay, cool. So I'll keep the questions to the end. So you can type it in the chat box. And after I'm done presenting, I'll answer your questions. Okay. <clears throat> so uh, I'm going to uh, talk about the area we're going to uh, visit. So first, we are going to deal with three districts in particular. That is Chandigarh district. Uh, Chennai district and Thiruvallur district. So we'll be focusing on those areas. Kanchipuram district, the, the, there are no, what do I say, new butterflies. So I've not really covered that. And plus that has a very limited scope of talking about because in the redistricting, it comes more into the uh, raptor uh, zone. So I really don't have a lot of butterflies there because it's more of grassy areas. And you get the same type of butterflies throughout the region. So butterflies tend to congregate more towards the forested zones. So I've taken the more forested beds in the entire North Chennai region. So apart from only talking about the common species and some interesting species, I also kept the slides of the uh, species which are sometimes confused with. So that that will be of some help for people who are starting into butterfly watching. So as I mentioned, I will be talking about this zone. I call it the man mask uh, zone because it looks like a guy's face. So we, I've, I've not covered the entire Thiruvallu district. This part of Thiruvallu district has a small portion of Eastern Ghat Hills. So the Eastern Ghats as such are a very diverse zone and have a completely different, different ecosystem. Uh, so I didn't want to merge both of them. So I've kept it more of the tropical dry evergreen forest zones along with some uh, coastal wetlands and grasslands, arid zones like Nanmangalam and uh, that, that kind of area I've just uh, selected right now. And I've gone as south as Mudliar Kutta. Though uh, most of the sightings which I'll be talking about today will be primarily from Chennai and Thambaram area. So the immediate outskirts area is where you need to go to find most of these butterflies. So how many butterflies do we have in this region? We have around 150 species of butterflies, of which 128 are seen in Chennai alone. And out of this 128 in Chennai, we have about 120 just from the Gidi National Park. So it shows how diverse that national park is. It has almost uh, more than 95% of the butterflies which we have in the city, right inside just one small national park. And uh, generally, when I say the number 150, people don't uh, take it at face value. They, they can't relate Chennai and butterflies because generally when we talk about butterflies, we immediately go to Northeast India or Western Ghats or the Himalayas. So the, that notion has to be first trashed that butterflies are not found in city limits. We have a lot of butterflies in Chennai. So the first myth that has to be broken is that uh, all butterflies look alike. There are some butterflies which are very similar and that's why people tend to not identify them as easily and separate them as species. But there are 74 butterflies which we get throughout the year very commonly. So that's a very good uh, base mark to start with. 
Beyond the 74, there are some species which are slightly common but are not found throughout the year. So that comes to a halfway mark of like, uh, I would say, 80, 85 species. After that, if you sit with a book and have solid pictures and can compare with what you've got, you'll be able to find more differences. So I'll be getting into that in this presentation. So I don't want to spend a lot of time on the common butterflies because this is something you all might have come across. But if I take any habitat in Chennai, and any location, even if it's in, within city limits, prob the probability of me seeing all these species is very high. So I'm going to start with the Nymphalidae family. So these are brushwood butterflies and generally people associate insects with six legs. Whereas these butterflies, they have special modification of, their, of the front two legs. So you only see four legs when the butterflies sit. So the I'm going from... Uh, uh, left to right, the blue pansy, lemon pansy, yellow pansy, and peacock pansy. These th four are the most common species of pansies we get, and we find them in very open countries. So, if you have a small grass and even a small grassy patch near your gardens, you will definitely see one of the four of them. Then there's the tawny coaster, which is a very common butterfly. I'm sure everyone would have come across. So, apart from the nymphalids, the next most common uh, family, in my opinion, is the lichenid family. But why did I say in my opinion? Because I go looking for butterflies. Generally, because of their small size, this family, which I'm selecting here, the second row, except for the tawny coaster, this family gets, un they do not much attention focused on them because of their size and the differences are really, really small. So we have around 42 species of uh, lichenids. Uh, we call them blues also. Out of which the lime blue, gram blue, common pyro, plain cupid, and common cerulean are found in most garden setups across Chennai. Then comes the peridae family, which is the white and yellow butterflies. We have the common grass yellow, the common emigrant, common jessamine, Indian psych, and the uh, common gull. So most of these uh, butterflies are again seen in more of uh, arid setups. Then comes the Papillonidae uh, family. Papillonidae are uh, the uh, uh, Indian common born one and the northern lime swallowtail. So these two species are found in all gardens. I'm sure a lot of you would have seen, uh, especially the common lime, at least uh, during the October, uh, sorry, during the August, September migration season when they tend to congregate. Up. Last but not the least, this is the uh, Hesperidae family which is uh, the skipper family. They are called skippers because they are known to hop very fast when they fly. They have a very droppy flight, like they're skipping through the air. And uh, they are generally ignored by even those who are interested in butterflies because they are very hard to identify. But if uh, someone really likes a challenge, then this is a good place to start with. We have, I think, uh, 27 species of Hesperids and uh, out of them, I, uh, 10 of them are very, very confusing and a lot, there's a lot of debate whether you need uh, uh, a specimen in hand to identify them. But uh, now uh, with the advent of photography and uh, other ID markers, now with just a picture, we are able to talk about what are the phenotypes we can figure out and how exactly we can separate these species. So now I'm going to go into a couple of confusing species. Is the slide changing by any chance? No, it does not change. No. no. Ah, ah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, no. yeah, yeah. Okay. So this is uh, one of the most commonly uh, asked uh, questions. So the difference between the two casters we have in Chennai. So on a cursory glance, a lot of people identify all casters as common casters because they think that the common caster will be more common. Actually, the angled caster is more common than the common caster in Chennai. In fact, the common caster in our city limits is only found in Indranagar and in Guinea National Park and the neighboring IIT maybe. Wherever else we go, especially in gardens, we normally get the angled caster. So due to lack of time, I've not really uh, written about the ID pointer, but I've just marked them. 
So you see the area I've circled, right? So the common caster has a very marked appearance as such. And these lines, there is a lot, there's a greater frequency of lines here. Whereas the angle caster, it's more spaced out. And generally, uh, this is a very controversial ID marker, but at least in Chennai, it normally works. Common casters are slightly bigger than the angled caster. So if I'm, and I can always tell from where I am. So supposing I am in the outskirts of Chennai, I can, my chances of getting an angled or a common are 50-50. If I'm closer towards Chennai, I can tend more towards the angled caster. But all this will come more with experience than with, uh, and local knowledge, that's more important. So it's always better to go with ID parameters than just uh, field guesses. Another uh, pair which is commonly confused is the, uh, what is wrong with the system? Ah, yeah, are the egg fly males. So the Danite egg fly and the great egg fly are two egg flies we get and a lot of even prominent lepidopterists would go with the fact that this bluish tinge you see here, right, is the best key for identifying between the Danite and the great egg fly. However, uh, now in Chennai, we've got a couple of uh, specimens where the Danid egg fly also has a bluish tinge. So the best way to go forward with this in that case is by this marking. You see this white marking here at the edge of the butterfly. If it is very prominent, then I can tend towards a Danid egg fly male. However, it's, it, if it is not a continuous spot like this and it's slightly demarcated into two spots and they're slightly smaller and the top spot is smaller, I can tend towards the greater egg flight. And uh, if, with a little imagination, this larger spot here is more oval shaped, whereas this is a more diffused uh, comma like marking. But this particular, in the, in the Danid egg flight, it's always oval shaped. The great egg fly, sometimes this uh, comma like marking tends to get little oval shaped, but uh, generally, I would say what we get in Chennai, we don't have to worry about that. So, and another aspect you can look into is size. The great egg fly is always, always bigger than the Daniel egg fly. So, the males are not that hard to figure out, but the female of the Daniel egg fly is sometimes difficult to figure out. It copies the plain tiger. So, uh, sorry, the plain tiger, I made a mistake there. The uh, plain tiger feeds on Kelotropis, which is the milkweed plant. And it imbibes that toxin which it gathers as a caterpillar into when it becomes an adult, which doesn't happen in a lot of moths, by the way. Butterflies have mastered that evolutionary trick of uh, gathering the toxins which they have in a caterpillar onto the adult. Couple of moths which feed on Kelotropis, for example, don't have that ability to be toxic when they grow old. However, that's seen in butterflies. So the plain tiger is a poisonous butterfly to most birds. So in that, so to, uh, there's a mimicry by which the uh, Danidic fly female tries to mimic the uh, plain uh, tiger so as to appear that it is uh, toxic in nature. The, uh, there are again a lot of ID parameters people use, especially uh, the Danidic fly uh, in, my, in my experience again. When I have been in the field, I've seen it's a more faster flying butterfly and a very strong flight. Whereas the plain tiger is a very feeble, low ground flying butterfly, very slow flying. But the best way of telling them apart is by checking the abdomen color. The plain tiger always has an orange colored abdomen, whereas the dynamic fly female will have a nice gray abdomen. And even when I'm talking about the habitat, I would rather see the Danid egg fly in more forested habitats, but it doesn't mean I won't find it in a grassland setup. I would find it in a grassland setup, but if there is a forest thicket nearby, then there's a greater chance for that. But if I'm in a completely open setup and uh, I see a butterfly flying slowly, then I can tilt more towards the plain type. Of. Is the slide changing again? No, no? No, it doesn't happen. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, no. I don't know, some problem with my system. Okay. So the uh, common crow, uh, so the common crow and the double branded crow. This is a, a pair which not a lot of people are aware of because generally when people see a brown colored butterfly, 
they just go with the crow and they, uh, I think uh, because it's uh, also a bird's name generally it's a very comfortable thing for people to say ah we saw crow and leave it at that so there are actually three types of crows we have in Chennai I have mentioned the other one a little later so the difference we say between these two species are the numbers based on this ID marker so this is an, a clear example on which I was talking about earlier right that earlier only on a hand on uh, when you see the butterfly in hand you'll be able to tell them apart so till 2011 a lot of people did not uh, know how to identify the double branded crow without having a specimen in hand then with the advent of photography and more pictures coming in people noticed that in the normal crow which we see the common crow there's only one spot here and it is not followed by any spots immediately towards it whereas the double branded crow is followed by these two spots and these spots here, uh, they are more irregular, whereas these come in a very a more regular pattern. Like you can draw arcs, right, on these. These are not so regularly patterned for us to draw any arc. So that's another example by which I can say, you know, with photography, we have improved our skills. Because uh, I, for example, have taken pictures of double branded crow when I, from 2008, 2009, and I never knew about it till this recent uh, ID parameter which you are able to find out based on photographs. So that's another reason by which I can say that we've improved our knowledge in butterflies. This is a very, very confusing uh, uh, difference for first timers because uh, they, they're normally taught wrong. So there's, there are two species, the blue tiger and the dark blue tiger. Generally, uh, when uh, someone tries to start butterflies, they don't want to talk about the very confusing uh, ID parameters. So I'm still going to go ahead with it because you need to understand the difference clearly. Because a lot of people think that if I see a blue tiger, which is bluish, more bluish in color and is more blacker and darker, it, it's a dark blue tiger. That's not the case. Because, so that's why I've taken these two pictures. If you see the shade of blue is pretty much the same and even the brown, this is the dark blue tiger, just a tinge more browner. There are some, I've seen some blue tigers which are much bluer than the, the bluest dark tiger also. So in that case, there's this small cell area I've marked, right? So how do we keep a, 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 a map on that place? Basically, you see the head. So from the head, if I'm going to draw a straight line, through this, through the, through the thorax, I will land up with this cell spot. So if there's a lot of brown, for example, sorry, if there's a lot of brown here, then yeah, it's a dark blue tiger. But if that area is not so brown and there's more blue marking there, it's a very thin slit. I call it a slit there. So if it's a very thin slit marking, then I will tend towards the blue tiger. If it's a dark, it's a, the dark blue tiger will have a more larger slit here. And blue tigers, uh, you will see them throughout the year. Dark blue tigers are uh, seasonal to Chennai. We don't get them throughout the year. We only get them from June till probably September. We don't get them beyond that. So these migrate during the southwest uh, monsoon migration. This is a very, I, it's, uh, the dark evening browns are rare butterfly. But I still kept it because a lot of people have sent pictures which turned out to be dark evening browns. So the common evening brown and the dark evening brown are both pretty tough to identify butterflies. But the best way to go forward, and especially with evening browns, uh, I'm not sure if you guys are aware, but there was a Guinness, uh, not Guinness, uh, Olympic, I'm not sure, one of the one record which was recently done for uh, of the uh, person who, got, who I think got 50 to 70 uh, different morphs of the common evening brown. So the same butterfly has around 50 to 70 morphs. So it's extremely difficult to identify the butterfly just on morphology and how it looks based on patterns. So the best way to go with these two species is this tail marking. If I find it more tailed and the upper part more curved. See, this is curved but there's no protrusion here. If the protrusion is here, I can go for a dark evening brown. And I would preferably look for dark evening brown only after a very, very heavy rain. So, for, uh, for example, uh, after the Chennai floods, that point we had a lot of dark evening brown for that one week. It's a very, very seasonal butterfly. Only after very heavy rains, 
we get this butterfly. So this is something which people would get. Uh, there are a lot of mistakes in this, so I thought I'll spend some time on this. So there are three species, the common immigrant, the mottled immigrant, and the cabbage white. Uh, when people started butterfly watching, especially if you see the old lists from 2006 and from 2000s and the 1980s, you would find the cabbage white listed as common in Chennai. That's because a lot of people confuse the cabbage white butterfly with the common immigrant. The cabbage white is actually a higher elevation species and is normally seen only uh, in very, very uh, grass, in high altitude grasslands. But that doesn't mean that you can't see it in Chennai. The Chennai population is actually probably an accidental population, which comes in winter. So uh, the working theory is that uh, along with the vegetables, few pupae come uh, to Coimbatore, and uh, it's probably uh, they they hatch. Uh, the I won't I don't think I don't think that there is a viable population to go in Chennai, though. Uh, there has been one uh, case in uh, somewhere in the southern parts of uh, the Himalayas, uh, sorry, the foothills of the Himalayas, where uh, they found a new host plant and they started coming down. In Chennai, I don't think that's happened yet. So uh, right now, we think that they are stragglers which come through uh, the Uti uh, cabbages. So the more common butterfly we get is the common immigrant and the mottled immigrant. So now when I have these two pictures, it looks pretty obvious, right? Common immigrant looks more greener. Mottled immigrant is a more paler butterfly. Generally, the mottled immigrant, if you see, it's, it's an unmarked butterfly here. Okay, there's no marking here. And it has a dull uh, appearance. And the most important part is what I said first. There's no marking here. Now it looks pretty easy, right? Now I'm going to show you a slide of all the immigrants I've taken in Chennai. This is, all of these are common immigrant marks. They are all the same common immigrant. So it's a very variable butterfly. So for example, when I immediately look at this, you would tend to think this looks like a mottled immigrant, right? I'll just go to the previous slide because it looks pretty similar to this, right? So the best way to tell is based on the markings I said, right? You can see this marking here, a marking here. If I see those two markings, immediately it's a common immigrant. You don't have to think about it. Now, when I get a butterfly like this, what do I do? So this can be a pretty confusing butterfly. But again, if I notice clearly, the mottled emigrant, it has a more dark tinged back uh, edge here. And it uh, has scaly markings here. Whereas this is more of a plain marking, no scaly lengths. So with that, I can tell, okay, that's a mottled emigrant and this is a common emigrant. Uh, there's a good cheat code you can use in Chennai though. If you see a smaller species of immigrant flying more towards the ground and not very high, you can think, okay, there's a good chance it's a mottled immigrant. Because generally, uh, I don't know why, for, but for some reason, the mottled immigrants, which I've seen, and it's only in Chennai, by the way, what I get in Chennai generally fly more lower. The common immigrants, you would see them fly, they're the most uh, random flying butterflies you would have ever seen. They fly at all altitudes, all directions. It's a, it's a very... Uh, it's unpredictable droopy flight the common immigrant has. Mottled is more of a faster flying butterfly and has a more straight line trajectory when it flies. It, it, ha it flies with, it looks like it's flying with purpose, unlike the common immigrant, which looks like it's very randomly flying. Well, that's another trick you can use in the field if you, because sometimes you will not be able to photograph everything we see, right? I'm sure that's, you guys will know that based on birds itself, we can't identify everything based on just our photographs, right? We'll have to identify based on what we see. So that, these kind of clues will help us a lot. So uh, recapping, yes. emigrant towards the ground, flying in a more purposeful manner, there's a good chance it's a mortal emigrant. Little larger, hapas are flying in all sorts of directions and at any height, I can go with common emigrant. Then the lichenid family, I didn't want to spend too much time on because it's a very confusing group. But uh, two species which I felt that have to be spoken about are the common hedge blue and the lime blue. So generally the lime blue is a very common butterfly. And when I mean very common, every one of you would have seen it without realizing you have seen it. It's there in everyone's garden, in every house, if you are in an apartment, if you are in, a, in the most populated place in Chennai also you will have lime blues there. 
and I'm not really sure why also <laughs> because you don't have citrus plants everywhere and they get attracted to tamarind trees though it is not the host plant I have uh, I'm sure even uh, uh, Ramadi has seen that in IIT there are a lot of places in which you will see uh, tamarind trees surrounded by smaller blues around it also a lot of butterfly activity around it so generally you would they would be uh, the lime blue so the difference between the common ash blue and the lime blue is based on this marking so the lime blue has a more larger marking and it's double line whereas this is a single line and why i'm stressing on the common hedge blue is the common hedge blue is always found along with the lime blue but not in uh, uh, normal numbers for example when i see 2000 lime blues yeah and i said 2000 in chennai we get, i think 2017 we had a, a, a flock of, uh, no, we say swarm in a kaleidoscope, sorry, in butterfly, it's called a kaleidoscope of butterflies. So we saw a kaleidoscope of 2000 uh, lime blues. And out of that, one was a common hedge blue. So it's a very rare butterfly, but it generally is seen in larger numbers. So it's generally seen when there are larger numbers of uh, lime blue. So when you find a lime blue uh, congregation, and if, I, if there are like some 50, 60 of them, I would go looking for a common hedge blue. So in that, uh, it's a very good uh, ID market you can use. And the common hedge blue is a very rare butterfly in Chennai. In fact, there are only uh, two sightings of it in recent history. Yeah. So this is the last uh, slide I've, ha I've kept for the identification parameters. The red Helen versus the common Mormon female. Now, I should have actually kept uh, the other ones too, but I'm stressing on this for a particular reason. The red Helen right now is going through throughout India. We're doing a rechecking of the distribution of red Helen because it was earlier thought to be an endemic to the Ghats, the population, the Western Ghats, at least. There are two subspecies. So, what's seen in South India was thought to be an endemic. However, and now there are a couple of reports from uh, Bangalore and uh, other plain areas. And now I had one record from Chennai. So I would like people to look out for the Red Helen. So you can tell them apart based on the white marking here. So you see it's discontinuous here, right? There's a fine marking like here. There's a, you see that uh, brown lines coming through, right? Whereas here it's a contiguous uh, marking. I've not mentioned, but I'm going to, uh, I'm not mentioned the PPT, but I'm going to talk about it anyways. The, this common Mormon female is actually mimicking a common rose. So if the same butterfly had, let's say, a red abdomen, right? Then I would go for the common uh, rose. I've not mentioned it here. I'll, uh, I'll send it uh, later on. So that's about the uh, interest as uh, the uh, tough to identify species. And I didn't want to spend a lot of time. So if you have any ID uh, requests, I thought I would uh, help by creating some templates and uh, helping people with that. So I thought uh, since we're talking more about Madras, we should talk about what we have in Madras and what's interesting from Madras. So this is a butterfly which not a lot of people associate with Chennai. This is a southern bird wing. And it is, uh, it was formerly India's largest butterfly. Now there's a little debate on what is India's largest butterfly. So this is the largest butterfly in South India, I would say, and in Tamil Nadu. This butterfly is normally associated with the Western Ghats and till 2015, that is actually till the time we spotted it in Chennai, it was considered to be an endemic to the Western Ghats. So this butterfly, if you want to see, you have to go to Crocodile Bank. And in Crocodile Bank, there is, I think, uh, generally there are four of them, which we see during uh, the June, uh, maybe May, yeah, May to September season. That's the best time to find them. There is a Garial enclosure. So if you go to the Garial enclosure, you will find them flying above you. And it's a very majestic butterfly. It's a, it's, it's a, it's. When it flies above you, especially the ones in Croc Bank, they are my favorite ones. Among I've seen the butterfly in many places in the Western Guards, but these ones are they are much bigger than what I've seen in the Western Guards. And the, they, they, they don't fly, they glide. So 
so it's a, it's a very very de-stressing thing to go just sit there near the garyan enclosure and watch these bird wings fly above you and uh, interestingly they love feeding on the spider lily so when you are around the ecr and if you have any work around the ecr and if you find spider lilies nearby i would keep my eyes open for southern bird wing because generally they, they like spider lilies so much that i have seen the southern bird wing in my college which is not so far from uh, crocodile bank but because it has spider lilies they go looking for the spider lilies now in that region so if you live along the ecr or close to the ecr or have anyone's or know anyone there and when you are visiting them you should probably look for the bird wing too another butterfly which uh, not a lot of people associate with chennai is the blue mormon this is also a pretty large butterfly and uh, very very difficult to take a picture of because with a, most of the time you would see it fluttering by at uh, supersonic speed <laughs> and uh, you will only see one dark colored butterfly with blue flashes fly, flying around this butterfly is uh, actually was very very rare at one point but after the chennai uh, rains we had the chennai floods right after that its population started to pick up a bit except for uh, i think uh, 2018 when we didn't have much rain apart from that year most years when the when it starts raining we get the blue mormon so this year we've already seen the blue mormon mormon because we had these rains right so the blue mormons already been recorded so generally after a good shower you would find them in places like uh, iit gini national park mcc but that doesn't mean you won't find them in the city sometimes if you are lucky you might find uh, them in the arepuram or nungambakkam and, and flying around generally after the rain though that's the preferred habitat is again i would say forested areas but there's always an exception to everything so i have seen this uh, blue mormon butterfly in july when there was no rain and in mudalayar kuppam where the where there are no trees around <laughs> so in the back water i saw this butterfly mud puddling so again butterflies can come anywhere and the the only rule in lepidoptera uh, i lepidoptera lepidoptera in studies is that there are always exceptions to every rule so you should all when there is a set rule nothing no butterfly follows that so these are all conventional correlations we have kept so if it follows that well and good else uh, yeah <laughs> there are no explanations for like for example what i told right the blue mormon in a place after uh, after uh, not after rains and in a very very open setup there is no explanation of what the butterfly is doing there but sometimes these things happen and that's what makes them very interesting to study this is the spot swart tail this is another species which not a lot of people associate with chennai because a lot of people think it's a butterfly from rajapalayam or shivaliputur that area or coimbatore side so the spot swart tail we get every year from may to september except for this year for some reason and uh, we are actually i'm actually little worried as to why it's not come this year because till uh, till uh, 2019 we used to get the spot swart tail in small numbers for example i used to see uh, maybe 10 15 40 40 maximum 40 of them in 2019 for for some reason i and we are still not evaluated why we got 500 of them suddenly in chennai and all in gini national park there was a big kaleidoscope of 500 of them and uh, so based on that uh, what we thought is okay this year will be pretty good too especially that it's rain but for example the spots were tails are no show this year <laughs> so this is another place where i said no we can't predict what happens in butterflies it's very very difficult to understand their biology and what exactly goes on and what brings them and what does it bring them to a place because actually speaking compared to last year this year is much it it has more, it's had more rain and i would say there's been less uh, uh, strain on the environment in which it lives for example in iit and in gidi national park even few people are allowed now and i don't think much clearing has also happened so the larval host plant would have grown so i really can't say why they didn't turn up but generally this is one of the things i every migration i look forward to is the uh, spot sort in my part 
This is the brown king crow. This is another butterfly which uh, again threw a lot of people out of. Uh, again, we don't know why it came here. This is a butterfly which is purely found in very very heavy rainfall regions and evergreen forests. But uh, <laughs> we got uh, not once or twice. We've got the butterfly at least ten times now in Chennai, and all of them singly, along with the other crows, the double branded and the common crow which I showed earlier. So when they migrate, that's again during this uh, September-ish time, you would see one or two brown king crows flying along. So you'll identify it by this, the, there's a lack of markings here. So the common crow, the double banana crow, which I showed earlier, there'll be a few markings here, which I spoke about, right? The common crow is irregular and the double banana crow, you can draw arcs, right? Whereas here, there are no markings at all. This is another butterfly, which actually right now I think is in the front, uh, one of the front runners for becoming the national butterfly of the country, the Indian Awab. Another butterfly which is not associated with uh, Chennai. Normally it's seen in uh, wetter forests and uh, I would say slightly broad leaved forests. Nevertheless, I think because we are close to the Eastern Ghats, we get them now and then in uh, uh, MCC, especially in the Tamram area only we have got the Indian Awab so far. And uh, this is, a, I kept this picture for a reason. Can you see the butterfly sticking its proposals out, right? So basically here, what it's doing is, it's collecting nutrients from uh, feces of some uh, bird. I'm not sure what. So the butterfly is extracting its nutrients from this uh, bird feces. So probably some urea content or whatever content. I'm not sure what particular uh, uh, what particular uh, reason it's taking the bird faces from. But generally this process is known as mud puddling, where then they take uh, nutrients from the soil, from uh, bird droppings, from animal urine, from alcohol to rotten fruits. Sometimes, and in fact, an Indian Awab, I have seen one Indian Awab in Kerala feeding on rotten prawns. So it's very, very uh, strange as to why they do it or what exactly is the reason, but uh, uh, yeah, it does happen. And sometimes, I'm not sure if, how true it is, but there are reports of Indian Nava coming on carcasses of animals too. So it's a very interesting butterfly to do research on. This is by far my uh, highlight from Chennai. It's the red spot Jezebel. So this species has only been seen once and by me in Indranagar in 2016. It's actually a Northeast species and uh, there is no recent, uh, when I mean no recent in the last 200 years, it's not been seen uh, uh, in outside the Northeast of India. So this is the first record outside of the Northeast of India and the first record in South India. So the, this probably came along with some cyclonic storms which we had uh, in uh, May of 2016. So in that cyclonic storm, uh, probably it brought along these red spot Jezebels. I think uh, a lot of you will be familiar with Varda and how Varda got uh, the uh, pelagic birds in, inland, right? So like that, the storm before that got uh, this red spot Jezebel probably. From either the, it's one of the Andamans too. So I'm not sure if it came from the Andamans or if it came from Northeast India. Yeah. It's, uh, we, we, if we see it again, probably we'll be able to tell. Another peridae, which is important for Chennai, is the chocolate albatross. Why? Because in the whole state of Tamil Nadu, it's a very rare species found in very, very restricted places. Again, uh, when people talk about the chocolate albatross, immediately they will uh, think about wet forest and dry uh, air in, in uh, evergreen forest areas with the heavy rainfall. So I think you would have heard me say a lot of times, right, that this butterfly is found in uh, heavy rainfall areas and needs a lot of water. Yet we get it in Chennai even though we don't have that much rain. So that shows that, you know, our understanding probably is incorrect, that we correlate this butterfly to only higher rainfall regions. So maybe that is true and maybe these butterfly, butterflies are known as ecological indicators. They can predict uh, rainfall trends. They can predict climatic trends. So, for example, the presence of all these uh, wetter forest species in Chennai 
could indicate that maybe in the future we might start having higher rains. But if we start getting uh, lesser of these species and we get more only arid species, then we can think, okay, maybe we have more uh, of more of a failed monsoon season this year. As of now, that's the best way we are able to tell apart good monsoons and bad monsoons based on butterfly. There's actually a paper which is uh, being uh, done, I think, based on how the butterfly abundance in South India is able to correlate with the uh, uh, but uh, with the monsoon of that year. Uh, there's a study being done. So when that's done, maybe there'll be some more clarity on why exactly we get heavy rainfall species in places like Chennai also. Then this is the, the most uh, recent addition to Chennai, the little tiger piro. So this species is uh, only seen in IIT and it's been seen, I think, uh, three, four times after the, the first sighting. So this species is actually normally known from central India and uh, recently in uh, 2019 or 18, uh, a small population was found in a railway uh, station in uh, Coimbatore and uh, in a, another lake near Coimbatore. So after that, this is the only other sighting uh, in recent history, apart from few sporadic uh, places in Salem and uh, Rajapadhyam. The uh, well-known area for getting the little tiger piro is slowly establishing in Chennai around IIT and Delhi National Park. So maybe in, uh, uh, I'm predicting in another three, four years, we'll start getting this butterfly even more commonly. The beauty of this butterfly is throughout the year, you won't, you'll only see it at one particular point. Uh, it's very tough to predict which month that will be. But when it comes, you'll probably see like uh, 10, 15 of them. And they'll all be in the same patch. They don't move away from their patches. Among the blues, the cornelian is a special one because uh, it was first described in Chennai by E.Y. Watson, who did work in 1890. So after 1890, uh, this, is, this picture is from Nanmangalam. So this is the only other sighting of the cornelian after that uh, first discovery in Chennai. And uh, it's a very, very, very shy butterfly. So I would say that it's probably there in Chennai. But it's very, very difficult to photograph it because they are very, very sh uh, uh, shy as such. They don't like a lot of human interference and disturbance. So because of that, I would say cornelian has not been seen that much. Another problem with the cornelian is it's a canopy species. So normally it's very difficult for people, not a lot of people associate uh, binoculars with butterfly watching. But I carry a, a pair of binoculars when I go for, uh, especially forested areas, because you'll get species like this, which are very small and insignificant, so it's right on the top of the tree. So in that case, sometimes our cameras won't help. So with binoculars, we try and uh, work as much as possible. So I've actually seen a couple of species, sorry, a couple of butterflies which looked like the cornelia with my binoculars, but I'm not very sure till I take a picture. So because it's a canopy species, probably it's also been missed. But uh, yeah, basically, uh, it's, it's not been seen for a long time. And only, I think, in 2015, we got it again after 19, sorry, after 1890. The, the double-banded Judy is the only member from its family. It's known as the Rionid family, which are the metal marked butterflies. They were actually clubbed along with the blue family. But uh, they have this very typical posture. As you can see, it has its wings half open, right? So generally, all these uh, butterflies, they're called the Judies and Punches. We get more of them in Northeast India. In South India, we only have two species, one of which is the double banded, the other is the plum Judy. They have a very characteristic way of sitting. You can see it how it has its wings half open, right? So that's a very characteristic way of sitting. So immediately when, I, when you see a butterfly like that, and immediately flashing around like this, uh, constantly moving, I can immediately go towards the metal mark butterflies. And we, there's, there's no confusion in Chennai. We only get one species. The plum judies are very, very rare species in South India as such. So prob the probability of you seeing it is very minimal. And it's a more uh, wet forest species. Double banded judies are more uh, uh, possible species. And even the double banded judy, it requires a lot of rainfall and leaf litter. It, it's not found in uh, uh, clear forests. So, for example, if I go to a place like Adyar Punga, which is a new forest, 
there won't be a lot of old leaf litter. Whereas a place like uh, GNP, I won't even say IIT because IIT some patches are cleared regularly. So places like Gindi National Park and Madras Christian College are good places to look for the double banded judy. Though it's only been seen once, I still think that there's a lot of scope with this butterfly because it's a slightly shy species. So now that I've told, so now basically since I've told you about the rare species we have and that we have 74 common species and the reason that people don't observe so many species because of these confusing species, you might associate everything and club everything as just one species. So when you factor all that in, you will understand why we stand at 150 species and not just like 100 or 90. So where do I go looking for these butterflies? Oh, sorry, I forgot these two. Yeah, the, the tree flitter and the, uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on these because these two are very, very, very rare species. But the tree flitter and the uh, complete paint brush swift. Both of these species are known to be from wet forest regions. So the fact that they are in Chennai is uh, pretty surprising for us. And both, we have only seen it once. So there's not much uh, I can speak about it. And uh, uh, we, are, we are hoping after the lockdown gets over, I mean, lockdown's over, but after situations are conducive to go butterfly watching, we're going to start doing a host plant analysis for these two species, because it's very unusual that we found them. The other species, we can at least attribute that some similar species of uh, plant grows in the region. Whereas these two, we are not able to exactly ascertain what is the host plant. So we are going to do more studies when uh, time permits. So the places where we can go butterfly watching. Now, Gili National Park, though it's a treasure trove and it has uh, 118 to 120 species, unfortunately is not, uh, it's very difficult to get in, especially now with uh, what all has happened. So I'm going to probably say that you can try the uh, Children's Park. The Children's Park does have around, uh, I would say, 85 species. So maybe the Children's Park in around July to October is a good place to start with and get a real feel, feel of, you know, the area. Uh, sorry, a real feel of Chennai butterfly watching. Indra Nagar is another place where you can get a lot of the rare species of butterflies. So if you uh, don't want to buy an entrance ticket and want to just go for a casual stroll, there's a nice park uh, near First Cross Street in Indra Nagar. So that area is again a very good place for getting a lot of butterflies. I've seen 94 species of butterflies just in that park. So and it's a very small park. Uh, so it's uh, it's a very nice uh, experience to go walking around and seeing butterfly after butterfly on the hedges. Madras Christian College again, I think permission is a little difficult, but if you know people. You can try getting inside the Madras Christian College. Nanmangalam, uh, permissions are becoming easier nowadays. If you write to the forest ranger office, they provide permission and a forest guard. You will get more of arid species of butterflies. And that's a very interesting place because some species which you don't see that often, uh, like uh, the rings and some of the flats, I have not covered them in this presentation due to lack of time. But... Uh, those kind of rare to see species you can try in Nanmangalam. IIT again, uh, it depends on how, it, sometimes they are very nice and they love people, sometimes they are not so nice. So if you can get in, yeah, it's another forested place you can go. Theosophical Society also, I would put along with IIT, uh, they're a little finicky. Sometimes if you can get in, it's good. Theosophical has, I think, some 60 to 65 species of butterflies. And it's, it's, uh, it's not as rich as the other places, but it's still a good place because uh, the Great Orange Trip, for example, if you go in February, you can get a lot of a lot of people go into Theosophical Society to get the mini wet, the ashy mini wet, right? So that same time period, you get the Great Orange Trip also for some reason. So that's a good place to try for in Theosophical Society. Anayat Punga is a new forest, so it will still take some time for butterflies to get used to it. They are uh, they they do evolve faster and set into ecosystems quickly, but I would still say Adyar Punga doesn't have a lot of the required host plants. And even where it does, it's very limited. Right now, I won't say Adyar Punga is bad for butterfly watching. In Adyar Punga, you should know where exactly to go to find a particular species. That's not the case in the other hotspots. Like if I want to see a black Raja, for example, in IIT, I don't have any particular spot to go in IIT. I can try finding it anywhere and I'll get it. 
probably. But in Nadia Kunda, there are some very specific spots where I have to go and try. So factoring that if Adair Punga will take more time for it to be a more butterfly diverse zone, nevertheless, there's a butterfly by the name of the small salmon arab. So the small salmon arab is uh, well known from Adair Punga area and uh, my college and that area. So Kovalam, Kedambakam, Tayur, SSN. That belt is another good area where you have like around 80 species again. And uh, this is a very different type of habitat. That's why I marked it in purple. It's a very different type of habitat because it's a coastal, it's not exactly a wet, it, you can't call it a wetland habitat or a grassland habitat. It's a mixture of both. So I call it a coastal habitat in which you get very open species, which are different from what you get everywhere else. Like uh, you get species like silver lines and uh, 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 I would say another interesting are the tips crimson tip, orange tips, which are not that common in other parts of the city. So I could speak more and uh, <laughs> I've left out a lot of parts because I've already spoken a lot on this topic. But if you have any other questions, I'll be open to that. Yeah. Oh, thank you because that was, yeah. uh, that was fun and very, very informative. And uh, I think those, uh, you know, those, nuance to differences that you showed between several of the butterfly species. Very interesting. Never knew that it was going to be a big challenge to identify the blue tiger from the great blue tiger. But I yeah. knew it was a blue tiger. But then, yeah. Anyway, that was good fun. That yeah. was really very, very interesting. Thank you very much. And uh, I think there are observations and questions in the chat. Okay. So I'll, I'll quickly yeah. take it to them. Okay, uh, yeah. um, Are there hybrid crows? Are there hybrid crows? That's actually a very interesting question. So we're actually working on that right now because we have seen, uh, so there are a lot of examples in which interspecies have migrated, have uh, actually the, in, in not only butterflies and moths also, uh, the fundamental uh, concept of which what defines a species based on the whether two species can mate and produce viable offspring. We have seen a couple of species of butterflies which are not the same species, sometimes not even the same family. Mate. We are not sure if anything's happened after that, if any viable offsprings come. So I'm not sure of the hybrid crow, but if it does happen, I won't be surprised. Yeah. <laughs> As of now, no. no. Okay. I don't know why Dr. Badri is uh, asked this in grey lag -like geese along with barred and geese. I thought we were talking about butterflies, and not birds. Uh, okay. Uh, I... <laughs> This is about the uh, crow which was uh, coming along with the other crows. Oh, okay. Ah, correct, correct. Yes, yes. Yeah, it's, it's exactly like that. The same thing like birds, right? You oh, have that one odd fellow. It's like that, yeah. Yeah, yeah, Badri, I got it. Yeah, I got it. I got it. Yeah, I understood. Yeah. Okay. Um, Yuen says that he's seen blue pansies attending to dead crabs. Oh, okay. I didn't know that. Okay, that's and interesting. Shakti, and Shakti also says that she's seen Nawab on dead crabs. Ah, that's nice. Yeah. Okay. Um, Sarvajit says he's seen kaleidoscope of common tiger feasting on pile of rotten mangoes. Common tiger. Yeah, yeah. That they do tend to do that. Yeah. <laughs> Yuan says that he's a. Uh, you got a tree flitter in the, in the song lines farm in Melbourne. Oh, yes, correct, correct. He sent me that picture. Correct, correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that, yeah so basically, the tree flitter is only known from that area. Karigili <laughs> and uh, uh, his record and my record are the only records so far from our area. Oh, nice. Nice. That's very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you had mentioned, but Shakti says, how about Kovalam? I've seen many butterflies flying towards us. See, you did mention Kovalam, Kelambak. Yeah, yeah. Correct. Yeah. Kovalam, Kedam, Bakkam, Sayur. That's what I said. Yeah. Uh, how can we attract butterflies in our home garden? In, in our home garden. Ah, okay. So there are a couple of things which you have to keep in mind. So if you are going, it depends on what you want to do. Do you want to attract butterflies to rear them? Or if you want to attract butterflies just to see them? So if you're going with seeing, I would say that you have one post plant. And and I don't mean as some very fancy host plant. Normal lime tree, if you grow, right? You'll get lime blue. You'll get common marmon, uh, common lime. All of those butterflies will come and lay their eggs. 
Apart from that, if you have some nectary plants, common nectary plants, which are there on a website, for example, I found butterflies. There's a nice website in which they put some nice larval host plants and uh, nectar plants. So you can put those like uh, hibiscus and uh, not lantana. Don't grow lantana. I don't, uh, yeah. Though butterflies get attracted to lantana, I would prefer you not to use lantana. But there are a lot of other options like exora, which some of them are not native, but for uh, native species, I would say that you go to the website. There's a nice website in which you can check. Yeah. Okay. As usual, a lot of kudos. Enjoyed. Excellent presentation. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> Do common crows migrate during southwest monsoon? Common crows, a uh, small portion of them do migrate during the southwest monsoon, but more double branded crows actually migrate during the southwest monsoon. What happens is once they migrate and around during the southwest monsoon, there's a reverse migration which happens in the northeast monsoon, where again you have only blue tiger and only common crow migrate. The southwest monsoon you'll have blue tiger, common crow, double branded crow, and dark, uh, dark blue tiger. The reverse you'll only have the two more common species. Yeah. It's actually called double branded or double banded. So the crow is a double branded crow, okay. but the jury is a double banded jury. Some yeah, yeah. have brand, some have band. Yeah. Oh, I see. Okay. <laughs> now Shakti also suggests that for you know attracting butterflies, you can have a curry leaf tree, uh, sora and kalonj. Uh, yes, yes. Curry leaf is especially good for a common mormon. Yeah. Okay. Now. Tara wishes to know which is the best month to see mass butterfly migration. I would say August. That was the that was the, not this year, but uh, last year was pretty good. All these years it's been good except for this year. Where, for example, in IIT, there's the stadium, right? So in the stadium, when I've gone in like June or August, I've seen. I'm not exaggerating. I've seen ten thousand limes and five thousand common immigrants all sitting along the stadium and flying around. So that's the best. Uh, area to see. Yeah. When was this? This was last year and actually since 2016 onwards. For no, four which, years we have been seeing. No, which uh, month? I mean, which period? Uh, July, August, that time. Yeah, okay. So, July, August. Ah, so that, that is when the Southwest monsoon starts. They Correct. start moving. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. Dr. Badri says it looks as though bird enthusiasts and butterfly enthusiasts are advocating plants and feeders. Irrespective of whether those plants are native to those regions, you are coming. Yeah, <laughs> that's why I said better to check with the. Uh, uh, there's a nice website. I found butterflies. There they've mentioned the native uh, plants. I uh, I can only talk from what I know and what I see. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Watson says uh, Isaac came car made some concoction of fish and it attracted butterflies in Sikkim. Probably. Yeah, yeah. The, those butterflies are the rajas and nababs. Those are the more. There are more brushwood butterflies, the nymphalids, right? They have a more stronger proboscis, so they can uh, take more of those kind of materials. Yeah. Wood keeping. Kalpana wants to know: Would keeping out uh, fruit baits in cities be effective when attracting butterflies? So it's mixed response I've got. So I tried that in Indranagar. I have got. Uh, I tried pineapple slices. So for pineapple slices and uh, rotten pineapple slices, not fresh. Fresh pineapple slices don't attract anything but uh, flies. Rotten pineapple slices, I've got uh, common evening brown, then uh, uh, great egg fly, dinette egg fly, spots hotel, common jade. Those kind of butterflies do visit, but I would prefer you to keep it first in uh, a place where you can watch it constantly. Because it's not like uh, uh, the Western Ghats where you just keep slices and go and see it. Whenever you go, you'll get it. They are very, very specific in Chen Chennai. It's, they're not used to that, right? So they have to first be tuned into that, I guess. So because of that lack of that thing, you can't uh, go. I would start at home first instead of, and I would not do that in a forested area, especially like a place like GNP. Because uh, when you're putting rotten pineapple, Remember, we have other animals, and we should not start some something else in the Guinea National Park. So, yeah, you can't, you yeah. can't obviously go there and do this. Is only at home. Yeah, it's only at home. Exactly. Yeah. So, Kalpana wants to also quickly check with you yeah. on the same subject. What about guava? Guava, I've not tried. 
<laughs> I'm not trying to go But it might attract. It could attract um, common evening brown will come. Okay. So you could check, you could try and come back to us on that. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and you and, yeah, you and I and Kalpana both suggest that Premna species is also very good. Best native nectar plant yeah. in the environment. Yeah, yeah is good. Yeah. yeah. So, Usha wants to know, you were talking about rearing. How can we do that at home garden? Did you mention rose plants for attraction? Host, host, not rose. Host, ah, host, host. So yeah, host. host plants are basically the butterfly, the plant in which the butterfly lays its eggs. You call that as the host plant or the larval host plant. Roses don't, don't attract butterflies at all. The, 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 so, yeah. <laughs> so, in that case, I would, like what I said, you know, if you grow a plant like curry leaf or the line, which will attract the female butterfly to lay its eggs, then sir, you, you, you don't have to take the egg separately and put it in a jar and watch the rearing. You can see it naturally in the tree itself instead. That's the, yeah. Yeah. So, Premna is also good. Yeah, Premna is good. Yeah. Yeah. So, then uh, Gopinath, uh, he congratulated you on your presentation and, uh, you know, that he never knew so many rare butterflies were there in Chennai. So, wants to know, do butterflies have standard lifespan or it's different? Basis? No, it's very different. It's very different. For example, the bird wings I was talking about, right? So, the bird wings, I think it's only one now. It's, it's one set I see. So, I I would say that they live for two to three months, the southern bird wings. Whereas the uh, smaller blues, they probably have a lifespan of uh, a, a week or a week and a half. That's it. So it depends on the size of the butterfly and the family. So generally, the larger butterflies, like the swallowtails and the whites and yellows, they'll have larger lifespans. Whereas the skippers and the smaller blues, they'll have shorter lifespans. Okay. And Dr. Badri adds. Uh... Having fruit trees and allowing few fruits to get overripe on the tree itself seems to be a better alternative to laying fruit baits. Right? Yeah, yeah, that's true. That's it's true. A, yeah, it's an observation. All right. And then uh, Kalpana also wishes to know, could you tell us about some common predators of butterfly pupae? Common butterfly predators? Uh, no, no, no. Yeah. Uh, common predators of butterfly pupae. Butterfly pupae, praying mantis. That's the yeah, the biggest <laughs> villain you'll get is praying mantis. And uh, for if you're trying something like, ah, another thing you can try is Kelotropis. So if you want species like the plain tiger and striped tiger, right? So in that case, you'll have assassin bugs and uh, wasps. Yeah, so you'll have wasps coming on and uh, uh, laying eggs in the pupae. Assassin bugs will come and... Uh, uh, take all the nutrients, they'll, they'll basically feed on the pupae. So that's the, I would say, assassin bugs, praying mantis, and wasps are the biggest uh, threat. Yeah. Yeah, because she adds that she's seen holes in pupae. Probably wasps. So the wasp would have laid its eggs, and when it was coming out, would have made those holes. Okay. All right. So good job, great job, Vikas. And uh, I Thank think you heard the number of questions that are being posed to you. Okay. So, thank you very, very much. That was extremely informative. And, uh, yeah. I yeah. have expected anything less from you. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Thanks, Vikas. Yeah. And uh, thank you all for uh, participating in this uh, monthly meeting. And, again, a quick reminder to all those volunteers of Raptor Watch. We meet again at uh, 4 o'clock this evening for the third uh, orientation session. So that's about all. Unless there is uh, wishes to add anything. So Sudhakar, would you like to say something? Is there anything you want to add? Uh, as usual, because um, I did a wonderful presentation. He gave uh, a lot of insights and uh, I am sure that uh, a lot of people are going to take uh, butterfly watching uh, after watching this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank you, Vikas. Right. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So thank you all. Enjoy the rest of your Sunday and have a great week ahead. Bye-bye.